Frank Gaffney is with me, Executive Chairman of the Center for Security Policy and Vice Chair of the Committee on the Present Danger of China, Securing America with Frank Gaffney is his show, SecuringAmerica.tv. Uh, Frank, let's start with this clip I've got here of Tony Blinken here, the, uh, uh, the Secretary of State, talking about a huge threat that's facing us. This is, of course, climate change. Mr. Paul Plant. We will be mindful that for all the opportunities offered by the unavoidable shift to clean energy, not every American worker will win out in the near term. Some livelihoods and communities that relied on old industries will be hit hard. We won't leave those Americans behind. We'll provide our fellow Americans with pathways to new sustainable livelihoods and support as they navigate this transition. Right after taking office, President Biden created the Interagency Working Group on Coal and Power Plant Communities and Economic Revitalization. It's working across the government to identify and deliver federal resources to revitalize the local economics of coal, oil, gas, and power plant communities, and ensure benefits and protections for workers in those same communities. And as part of his American Jobs Plan, the President proposed a $16 billion upfront investment to put hundreds of thousands of people to work in union jobs, plugging abandoned oil and gas wells and mines. If we can stay true to these principles while meeting our climate targets, we'll demonstrate a model that other countries will want to partner with and follow. So, Frank, you heard it. It's ra- climate change is racial justice, and that is the role of our State Department. So the, the State Department, that's what they're up to, going around the world with all these racist, oppressive regimes that they have to work on. And their real concern is coming up with a model of dealing with our racism via climate change in America. It's the You would think that it was a fictional dramatization of what the Democrats think, and yet that is the, our, our official policy to the world now. Our official policy here at home as well, Alex. It's now a new pandemic and a new pretext for government control of our country, a government direction that will fundamentally transform our country to make it greener and cleaner and less carbon emitting. And, you know, at the final analysis, it is going to be dictating to the American people, um, both policies and programs and, you know, retooling of our economy and lives that I don't think most of us have any appetite for or really even an inkling of how dramatic this is. But look back at how fundamentally transforming this well, ongoing pandemic is the COVID one, the CCP virus, as I think of it. And you have a foretaste of what these guys have in mind and what they're capable of doing to us and to our country. Yeah, and I don't know where this goes, but I'll tell you one thing, though, is that our enemies and our adversaries abroad must be laughing maniacally at this and they must be thinking that this must be some sort of a joke and how did they get so lucky and this is one thing that i worry about i played a lot of clips from the president the vice president uh earlier in the in the show today frank complaining about the country about how horrible it is and how racist we all are and i I, it's a i know it's about the most obvious point i could make but we are taking our eye off the ball in a, a million ways if we're focused on of all the things that are facing this country our own racism, if that is really what we have to talk about every second, we're, we're going to have a really hard time going forward. But that's the idea, Alex. And, and let me just suggest to you that it is not just the idea, I think, of the radical left in America. It is the stated agenda of the most systematically racist country in the world, bar none. And that would, of course, be the People's Republic of China under the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I mean, after all, uh, it is a country awash with what has been, I think, aptly described as Han supremacism. That is the supremacy of the Han Chinese ethnic people. And look no further than the genocide that is being perpetrated by Han supremacist Chinese Communist Party against ethnic minorities in its own country. I mean, 
say what you will about George Floyd or mistreatment of you know black males uh, or our history it pales by comparison with what is ongoing right now and again don't take my word for it this is the stated position of both the Trump and Biden administrations some 1 million conservatively perhaps 3 million Uyghur Muslims incarcerated in concentration camps at the moment, some of them being, you know, worked to death in slave labor arrangements, others being organ harvested, others being uh, simply raped and tortured and, uh, and starved. These are people that are being systematically oppressed because of the racism of the Chinese Communist Party, and to the extent that they can help the left here, with whom they are partnered, promote this false narrative that we are a racist country. Yes, we can be torn apart, not just preoccupied, but torn apart internally by this preoccupation, and we can take, as you said yourself, our eye off the ball, which is that we are now increasingly, I believe, threatened directly by this Chinese Communist Party, as are our friends and allies and vital interest, not just in the Far East, but worldwide. And you've been reporting handsomely, Alex, at Breitbart, on the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, Xi Jinping, the dictator of China, was touting it at the so-called Baoao uh, Forum, uh, a, a platform for Chinese propaganda and uh, getting others to buy into it. This is clearly the purpose of the Chinese Communist Party is to use this belt and road infrastructure build out debt trap financed operation to dominate the world and impose its racist agenda, its totalitarian control on the rest of us. Uh, it does seem like, Frank, that this is something that is – there's a model that's taking place in the United States where the government is con controlling more and more of our lives uh, in conjunction with these corporations. And it does seem like it's starting to emulate a model that you see in, Chinese, in, in, in China. It just seems very similar. The corporations and the government are basically the same, and they control more and more power. The individual means nothing. And it's a it, if we get if you add that with globalism and the fact that America is kind of asleep asleep at the switch here as China starts dominating, if that happens, we are on a path where we're going to see maybe at a global level where China is just controlling everything. It, you can see the path of us getting there pretty quick if we're not careful. Again, you're absolutely right, and that's the idea. I mean, you've you've broken the code, Alex on the nature of Chinese communism. And yes, its use of corporate fronts, um, some of them are just state-owned enterprises, but some of them are nominally independent, non-government-owned enterprises, but they all work for the Chinese Communist Party. They all tow its line. They all are under a national intelligence law uh, whose Article 7 requires this, supposed to provide the government of China anything it wants, whenever it wants, whether it's their stuff or it's our stuff or anybody else's. And yes, I think that is increasingly what capitalism, woke capitalism specifically in America, is beginning to do. It is ideologically aligned with the Democratic Party and the radical left that dominates it, and it is in its service. And uh, the, the full extent of this is almost unimaginable. Alex, I think we've talked about this in the past, but one example of it is something called the ESG agenda, the Environment, Social Justice, and Governance Agenda, which um, the preeminent woke capitalist, Larry Fink of BlackRock, is using his $7 trillion under management to try to impose on American capitalists across the board. Many of them are now falling into line, um, partly because he owns parts of their company, but partly because they themselves are aligned with it. But it's, it's bringing them into conformity 
with the agenda, whether it's climate change, whether it's the Green New Deal, whether it is this whole social justice riff about um, our racism that has to be expiated through whatever means, you know, uh, buying people off or um, forcing, um, you know, diversity on corporate boards and so on. It, it is a comprehensive program that is well advanced. And, you know, I think we need to look not only at what are the forces domestically that are advancing it, but yes, as you say, the global reset, the global capitalists who are throwing in increasingly with the Chinese Communist Party to reorder not only how we operate in this country and our constitution and our freedoms, but really how the world is controlled as well. Yeah, very interesting points. And unfortunately, quite scary because we're all distract ourselves with uh, problems du jour. Um, let's talk a little bit about Israel, where the Netanyahu government is struggling to form a government. Can you give us an update on what's going on there and also the Biden administration allegedly demanding that Israel stop bragging about disabling Iran's nuclear facility? I don't know if that's true or not. And if it is, it's kind of startling that that's where the Biden uh, administration's head is at at the moment. But give me your thoughts on both. I think that sort of situation normal now in Israel, which is to say that the government can't quite be formalized. Um, it continues to operate on a caretaker basis because um, there are so many parties and they are so fractious. And even though the right has technically a majority, it can't coalesce to pull behind Bibi Netanyahu, who is under indictment and being prosecuted and um, obviously anathema to uh, even people who are ideologically aligned with him, to say nothing of the left. And so it kind of muddles along. And the only thing I can say is that at the same time Israel is beset with these conditions, as it has been now for a couple of years, basically, it is facing an increasingly unmistakable existential threat from a country, a government, that the Biden administration is determined to appease, to to align itself with, to um, enable, really, and that would be the government of Iran. And what I think you're seeing, Alex, <clears throat> excuse me, is a desire on the part of uh, those who uh, are hostile to Israel in this country and our executive branch and legislative branch, by the way. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing senators um, like Pocahontas and, and Bernie Sanders insisting that we have to begin changing um, the kinds of conditions under which we provide assistance to Israel, uh, never mind this existential threat, never mind the dangers that uh, it entails for a vital ally. Um, we now need to begin conditioning that aid on how it uh, conducts itself with respect to um, the very problematic uh, Palestinian uh, leadership of, of Fatah on the one hand and, and Hamas on the other. Um, these are the sorts of things, Alex, that I think um, are going to conduce to, as we've talked about before, um, a regional conflict at the very least, and probably one that extends beyond the Middle East. Because on the one hand, we have been emboldening the Iranians to become more aggressive, to pursue more openly their nuclear weapons ambitions. And we are putting Israel's back against the wall because they realize that we will not help them counter, let alone preclude that threat from metastasizing further. Yeah, and this is exactly where I wanted to go next, which is Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren calling on Biden to restrict aid to Israel. It's a this is such a slippery slope. It's so dangerous here because Israel. I, I think that they're they're going to be in so much trouble if America does not have their back, and half of America doesn't want to have their back. And when you think about it, the 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 hatred for the one Jewish state on earth, which is the size of New Jersey, which is a 
uh, a a beacon in a sea of just these horrible regimes in the Middle East, and yet it is uh, the country. It is it's such a bleak prospect, Frank. But where do you think we stand in this regard? I think that we have an alternative to the approach that we are embarked on now under this administration that that showed real promise to both serve as a break on these Iranian ambitions on the one hand, Alex, and to foster a degree of peaceable relations within the region that it hasn't known. Well, perhaps ever, but certainly not for a very long time. Namely, one, checking Iran, uh, as Donald Trump did with his maximum pressure campaign and ripping up the fraudulent Iran nuclear deal on the one hand, and on the other, fostering ties between Israel and a whole host of Arab nations. You know, they made a peace deal with four different states, uh, Muslim states, not all of them um, Arab, but several of them. And there were a number of others that were in prospect. If we simply returned to that basic strategy and plan of action, I think we will perhaps be able to avoid what seems to me otherwise, as I said, to be virtually inevitable. And the trouble with the next regional conflict is it may well be a nuclear one. And that has the potential to be a problem unprecedented in world history. We just have to look hard at whether the course that we're on now is going to invite that, is going to almost make it inevitable. And if so, whether we are going to revert to something that uh, that really held up, uh, I think, a very considerable promise for avoiding it. We need to get back, I think, to the Trump policy in the Middle East at the moment. Um, Frank, do you have a sense of where the Israel government's going to go if Netanyahu struggles to form a government or we're just going to head towards another election again? Is that basically it? Well, Alex, you know, making book on what the Israeli political system is going to come up with next is a, a losing game. I, I personally sense that um, it may be the end of the line for Netanyahu, that uh, the right is going to come together around the idea that there needs to be a successor to him, that they can't continue to go to the Israeli public and have almost inevitably, it seems, a sort of a, a hung process, uh, a, a government that can't finally get consolidated. Each time <clears throat> one thought that, you know, Netanyahu, <clears throat> excuse me, was going to pull this off. Each each time, now four times, he has been unable to do so. So that's kind of where I would be inclined to go, uh, or to say they'll go, but um, anybody's guess. So last one today is a little lighter, but in a way, sometimes these are some of the darkest stories. A story that is a rare one where I actually... God uh, was concerned that when we put this up at Breitbart, this is from our London bureau, that perhaps they were making, they had fallen for some sort of a joke. Um, but apparently a museum has targeted Jane Austen's tea drinking due to Black Lives Matter, have uh, instigated a race review, uh, a historical interrogation, as it's called, in museums across of across the United Kingdom. And Jane Austen's apparent, her uh, the t- drinking of tea was, I guess, some sort of elitist and thus uh, elitism, thus some sort of racism. And also due to the slave trade the, uh, with India, I guess, that the United Kingdom had taken advantage of the Far East and, and of India in particular, and thus it is all racist, and thus we all should not read Jane Austen's literature. Uh, if this sounds insane to you, that's why I thought it wasn't real, but apparently it's very real. I don't know if you if you caught this story, Frank, but uh, what's happening across the world? 
I haven't. Um, but I think it's of a piece with what's happening here, Alex. In fact, the Black Lives Matter movement has uh, metastasized, if I can use that expression, um, in lots of sure. quarters, particularly in, in Western Europe and, uh, you know, similarly woke um, elitist groups. And the trouble is there's really no limit to this, Alex. There's no place at which you can no, say, well, not right. That's that's enough. <laughs> Everything can be found to be offensive to somebody who can claim in some sort of distorted logic or some, you know, extrapolation of um, the history of things that, uh, you know, somebody must be punished. And and what I have to tell you that worries me much more than what's going on overseas in this regard is what's happening here at home. And this idea that we now have actually embraced reparations. When I say we, I mean the yeah, Biden certainly. administration, but it's now getting some of this stuff uh, enacted into law through its allies in the Congress. And and again, there is no limit to that. What 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 farm community or what other um you know, subsect of or sector of uh, of our population, uh, deserve, you know, is it, uh, you know, going to be extended beyond blacks to Asian Americans next? Is it going to be, you know, Islanders in the Pacific? I mean, who knows? But it does seem as well, though, they're doing. But here's the thing. They're, they're, the beginning, they're, it's about dividing us and conquering yeah. us, I'm afraid. And they're they're talking about reparations in Los Angeles, which again I was joking the first hour, Frank. That is Cal was California a slave state? I, I I don't know that it was. So it's the don't think so. In fact, I I don't think it was. Just a, just for those of you keeping score at home, and they're talking about they're going to do reparations for and who qualifies for reparations right. and who really are the oppressed people. And this is the thing and where it's not about that, obviously. Well. Yeah, of course. And it, will anyone pay for it? And of course, that's not what this is about. This is about just enforcing the sort of woke uh, orthodoxy. But when we have tea drinking is colonial, and if you like tea, then you're colonial and your literature is no longer deemed readable, uh, then this is where we're all, we're, we're going to, the society is going to die off if this is the case. And I don't think our geopolitical adversaries uh, are, ever, ever torture themselves with this stuff, and we torture ourselves with it endlessly. And they exploit it against us. That's my key point to you, Alex. When we call it woke, they are thinking of it as Marxist, and they are using yeah. it as a weapon to take us down. So not, it's not just that they're not thinking about it. They're not applying it to themselves. They realize that if they can use this kind of uh, technique, um, and, and climate change, again, is, is part and parcel of it. Um, for them, they understand this will... Take our eye off the ball. Yes, you can translate climate change activism into cuts in the defense budget. That's one of the things that is happening under this administration. It is veering in a direction to say that it's actually a top national security priority. But that's just another basis on which you can defund or underfund, at least, our military at a moment when these adversaries are ramping up for war. And that's no exaggeration, Alex, whether it's the Chinese and Western Pacific against Taiwan or what have you, or, or whether it's uh, the Russians going at it with Ukraine or whether it's the Iranians gunning for Israel and who knows who all else. Uh, you know, the Islamists who are uh, always out there. I mean, these are the sorts of things that we cannot afford to take our eye off of or to mischaracterize, misunderstand, uh, let alone fail to respond appropriately to. Frank Gaffney, really appreciate all you're doing. Securing America with Frank Gaffney, securingamerica.tv. Frank, well done as always. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you, Alex. God bless you. We'll take a break. The rest of the hour will be dedicated to your phone calls. Dedicated to your phone calls. Dedicated to your phone calls. Dedicated.